Boris Johnson has admitted that he was at a party in the Number 10 Garden in May 2020, even if he claims he thought it was a work event. At PMQs yesterday, Keir Starmer called on the Prime Minister to resign, saying he was a pathetic spectacle of a man. Rod Liddell, in his column for the magazine, agrees, and writes that the sooner Johnson is gone, the better. James Forsyth, meanwhile, in his cover piece, asked where this might be one mistake too far. Are we really seeing the end of Boris Johnson? Rod and James join me now. Rod, in this week's magazine, you find common cause with the likes of Keir Starmer, Douglas Ross, the Scottish Conservatives leader, um, in saying that ultimately the sooner Boris Johnson goes, the better. Um, what's brought you to this conclusion? Well, what's brought me to this conclusion is a rather moral, uh, the rather pompous phrase that he's lost all moral authority. You could argue that he'd lost all moral authority every previous time he's lied, but in this one where it's so patently clear and to such uh, uh, fury from the public, uh, then I think it's all gone. But I mean, the real reason he has to go is because he's of no use anymore. Um, in that Boris's deal with the Conservative Party is, you know, I will be incompetent and Boris-like, but I will win you elections. But that doesn't look very likely at the moment. Um, he's miles behind in the polls. I think the, the lowest the Tories have been in 10 years uh, behind Labour. So, so that thing which Boris once had, which is that he could win the elections, no longer looks as if it's true. The, the counter-argument, I suppose, uh, uh, and what some of the Conservatives will cling to, is that whilst Boris is incompetent and lies reflexively at a, seemingly every juncture, um, he gets the big things right, such as Brexit, such as winning in 2019, and crucially, you know, and we ought to give him credit for this, uh, telling Sage to get stuffed three weeks ago. You know, all of those were good decisions, uh, which I suspect the public rather likes him for. But it's become outweighed, and I think I, I just think his position is pretty much untenable. And James, that argument which um, Rod just uh, summarised is one that Michael Gove made to Tory MPs this week at meeting of the 1922 committee. He was there to talk about cladding and levelling up, but gave a speech saying on the big calls that the Prime Minister is still right and that's why he should have their backing. Do you think that the Prime Minister does have the backing of the majority of the Parliamentary Party right now? I mean, the majority of the Parliamentary Party right now don't want... Uh, the blood and drama of a leadership contest. But I think they are sitting and waiting to see uh, how the public react. You know, uh, Rod's right. The Tory party's relationship with Boris Johnson has always been very transactional. Uh, I don't think the Tory party would have made Boris Johnson leader except in the circumstances they were in where you know they had just come, I think, fifth in, in, in the European elections. Uh, they were polling very badly. They looked to be set for a kind of complete electoral wipeout. And, you know, as, as, as one, uh, someone who's known Boris Johnson for, for, for as long as Rod once put it to me, you know, the Tory party were only ever going to turn to him when they were kind of 2 nil down with uh, uh, 15 minutes to go. And, you know, he was their, their super sub in those circumstances. He came on. Uh, he won them a majority uh, of a size that I don't think any other Tory could have done. Uh, I think the danger for him now is if a sense goes that he's moved from electoral asset to liability, then I think you will see the ruthless side of a Tory party. Rod, Boris Johnson did offer an apology, or at least a part apology, at Prime Minister's questions this week, um, saying he could understand why people were upset, um, even if perhaps technically, just technically, he still believes he was within the rules. Um, did that sway you at all, um, his apology? Yes, it swayed me in the other direction, that he should go even quicker. Uh, I mean, it wasn't an apology. It was a, it was a weaselly little Tony Blair kind of non-apology apology. Uh, in that he apologised if people were upset, uh, so nothing to do with him. He apologised that there was that the party could have been better arranged, <laughs> and maybe they should have had it inside, whilst always stating that uh, uh, that uh, he, ha he hadn't broken any rules. You, you know, it was it was a non-apology, and I thought for the first three or four questions at, at question time, um, Keir Starmer got it absolutely right and was rather good. Uh, and I suppose that the problem will come for Boris when we find out the results of this investigation. 
I think uh, the thing which may hasten the Conservative Party view, and James will put me right on this, is if it is found that Boris was technically not breaking the law because, of course, Downing Street is crown property, uh, but if that is the only reason that the law wasn't broken, then I think that is a technicality which the public simply will not swallow, and I suspect Tory MPs won't swallow it either. James, do you agree with that? Do you think the report will be a pivotal moment? I mean, it does feel as though for ministers and the prime minister right now, the report's almost useful um, because they can just uh, you know, stonewall any questions by saying, just wait, just wait a few weeks. I think the report will be quite factual. And I don't, I think one of the reasons why um, some of those around Boris Johnson are so keen to kind of emphasise the importance of the report is it's not the report's job to write a sentence like the Prime Minister should resign. And I think that they will uh, hope to point to the fact that the report doesn't say that and say, oh, well, he's been cleared, time to move on. Um, I think the difference between this uh, report and so, civil servants are understandably reluctant to look like they are forcing a Prime Minister out. If you think of Robin Butler's report into the intelligence around Iraq's uh, weapons of mass destruction and how that was used to make the case for war in 2004, or you know, even Lord Geit's letter to Boris Johnson about whether he broke the ministerial code over the arrangements for redecorating his flat. You know, they, are, they, are, they, they don't want to be the person who looks like they have forced out a prime minister because you know, they, they are an unelected official, uh, not an elected politician. But I think the difference between this story and those stories is this is a very simple story for the public to understand. This isn't about whether intelligence should be triple sourced as opposed to single sourced, the difference between human intelligence and signals intelligence. It, 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 it's something much more simple and something that people feel far more viscerally. And I think this is one of the things that, that Tory MPs are saying is you know, that those rules in the first lockdown were so strict that, that people are kind of really furious at the idea that, uh, that people in government who were making those rules were, were, were finding ways um, to stay within the rules but do things that other people weren't doing. And I think that, that, is, that is where it is so dangerous for Boris Johnson. Rod, one of the things that appears to be keeping Boris Johnson safe or safer um, is ultimately the fact there is no consensus right now on who should replace him. And therefore, you wouldn't really have a neat uh, successor brought in. You could have actually quite a messy contest. Is there anyone who has caught your eye as um, someone who would do a better job? Yes, William Clouston, the leader of the Social Democratic Party. But him aside, and he's probably not in the running, Katie, at this point. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, I, I spoke to a Conservative MP this morning who told me that there were 250 of his colleagues who wanted Boris out. I mean, he said 250. Um, uh, and I, I think the, 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 some of the press and some of the commentators have got it into their heads that there will be a kind of genial coronation of Rishi Sunak. But there's quite a lot of people within the Conservative Party who do not want Rishi Sunak, uh, largely because of his fiscal policies. Um, and there are even more people in that party who don't want Liz Truss uh, for various reasons. Um, so I, I think you probably, I, I know James will put me right, and I'm sure knows this far better than I do, but my guess is that when a leadership election does come along, and my guess is that it will come along sometime within the next four to six months, you know, uh, that when it does come along, there'll be six or seven people on there. and the, the great lesson of Conservative Party leadership campaigns is that the favourite never wins. James, do you think that they'll be able to fit all the candidates in a potential Tory leadership contest in one room? Uh, I think there'll be no shortage of candidates. I think, again, as happened last time, there will have to be some kind of winnowing process. You know, the rules don't uh, don't formally require people to have a certain amount of support, but I think that that is what is going to have to happen because you know, when you are in government, you cannot have a contest with fifteen candidates at the start of it. Uh, 
I, I think there will undoubtedly be a contest. I think that, you know, I think there's, a, there's an odd jockeying. Um, no one wants to be the front runner in, in Tory leadership contest for the, for the reasons that Rod says. And I think so much of these Tory leadership contests depends on the, on the timing, the precise way in which this thing starts. Um, I, I think the, but I think one of the things that I will say is that when parties pick successors, they always tend to go for someone who is uh, the opposite of what went before. So uh, the Tory party went from, uh, you know, if you go through it, from Margaret Thatcher's domineeringness to kind of John Major with his you know, desire to just kind of, you know, Whip's desire to kind of keep the party together. They went from uh, the smoothness of David Cameron to uh, Theresa May's very different persona. Uh, they went from Theresa May to Boris Johnson. So I think the person who succeeds Boris Johnson, if there is a leadership contest, will be someone who, who, who feels very different to him in terms of political style and approach. Well, indeed, it, a good point, James. So in other words, they're probably going to choose someone competent and honest. Rod, can you think of anyone who would fall into that category? <laughs> uh, but can I think of anyone? Well, you see, I, uh, I, I always go with the crowd as a social conservative, therefore. Uh, I quite like uh, 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 Liz Truss at the moment. Uh, whether she, I, I mean, and people become, uh, people think that, that uh, John Major, for example, uh, was not a, a born leader, a born prime minister, but uh, and in fact, in my opinion, he turned out not to be a terribly good prime minister or leader. But uh, we, we, we don't think of people inhabiting that role until they actually inhabit it. Um, and so, frankly, it could be pretty much anyone. I don't know the runners and riders. Uh, I just hope it's someone who is a social conservative and who can row back a bit against uh, uh, in, the, in the culture war, which I think is one of the reasons, uh, an important reason, why those red wall seats went to the Conservatives last time around. It was far less the attraction of Boris and far more a, 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 a thorough going dislike of the anti-patriotism anti and, and wokeness of, of Corbyn. Now, James, we're talking about what a potential Tory leadership contest this year would look like, but perhaps you could help us envisage the other scenario, um, which is still possible. Boris Johnson has bounced back before. What do you think uh, the scenario is where Boris Johnson actually does get through this and what does he then need to do to secure his position if he can do anything? I think the scenario in which he gets through this is the Grey report is quite factual. It doesn't contain direct criticism of him. Uh, he saw, you know, but there are various senior heads in Downing Street role on both the political and the civil service side, allowing him to say that he's cleaned house. Tory MPs decide to stay their hand, you know, say, look, let's wait until we see what the results of these May local elections are. And then kind of gradually kind of other political issues come to the fore, cost of living, energy crisis. Um, then you have the May elections. They're bad, but they're not catastrophic. You know, he says, look, this is kind of classic midterm problems for the government. And we're coming out with measures soon to help people with the cost of living. And, you know, it, it goes on. And, and it's worth remembering that, you know, that, that, that always one of the reasons why uh, party leaders and particularly prime ministers survive is that, that, that their MPs want to wait for the kind of perfect moment to change leader or the perfect moment to, to, to trigger a contest. And there is never such a thing in politics. And that, I think, is the way that Boris Johnson comes back. And then he starts to say, look, we got out of uh, COVID restrictions before other places because of the decisions that I took. And he, he can rebuild that way. But I think one of the things that will be difficult for him is that even before uh, this story broke, um, this year didn't look like it was going to have much political good news for him in it, given, you know, the squeeze on cost of living from inflation, rising energy bills, and, and all of those things. And I also think he's at that difficult phase of his premiership where um, th there is a, at the beginning of your premiership, big statements. So if he came out and said, we're going to turn around every boat in the channel, that rally supports you. Once you have been in office for as long as he has now, when you say things, people are waiting to see whether they actually happen, rather than just giving you applause for what you say. And finally, Rod, is there anything Boris Johnson could say that would make you change your mind then make you think that actually he is the right person to lead the party? No, I don't think so. But I think, I think James is right. And I think that 
But that's not an unlikely scenario that he does continue to battle onward. I mean, I, I think the May the May elections are important. If you if you if, if they if they reflect what the polls are saying now, which is that you know thirty six percent of people who voted Conservative in red wall seats uh, will now no longer do so, then that puts a whole raft of seats up for grabs, especially where I am at the moment in uh, in Teesside. Uh, virtually the whole of Teesside uh, went conservative, apart from Middlesbrough Central. Uh, uh, once that happens, then you, you do have a whole bunch of very, very nervous MPs who will be agitating for change, as well as those in the party, <coughs> excuse me, who were never terribly happy with Boris in the first case. And actually, if you think about it, June, July for a leadership contest, it's actually not a bad time for the Conservatives to do that. Exactly midterm, but you, you know, you get a new leader in, honeymoon period, things look good for a bit. You hold another election and probably win it. You know, that's that's the other scenario. But I think James's notion that that he may well get away with it and just bluster on through is quite possible. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, James. So the Prime Minister urged MPs to wait until Sue Gray, the civil servant looking into number 10 parties, finishes her inquiry. So who is Gray and what might she say about the Prime Minister? I'm joined now by Jill Rutter, a former civil servant who is now a senior fellow at the Institute of Government. Jill, this week it's not just Boris Johnson who we keep hearing about, it's also someone called Sue Gray. Um, when a politician doesn't want to answer a question about various parties, um, the frequent reply is, let's wait till Sue Gray has finished investigating. Now, Sue Gray is a civil servant. Can you tell us a bit about her? So Sue Gray is quite an interesting person. She's um, a very senior civil servant. She's uh, Her day job is as a second permanent secretary uh, shared between the Cabinet Office and Michael Gove's levelling up department because she's in charge of relations with the devolved government. She actually, at the sort of times of the lockdown, it's quite interesting that she's only just recently come back to the Cabinet Office from Northern Ireland where she went off to be Permanent Secretary at the Department of Finance, um, put her hat in the ring to be head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which is a separate civil service, uh, but didn't get that job and so came back to London. But where she really you know, came to a degree of public attention, though obviously nothing like now, is as Director General of Propriety and Ethics in the Cabinet Office, where for the Cabinet Secretary and successive Prime Ministers, she would investigate uh, dubious behaviour by a variety of ministers. So, for example, it was Sue Gray that put the kibosh on Damien Green's career over yeah, his uh, the investigation into him. Uh, so that's Sue Gray's track record. So she's been there, done that in terms of investigations before. What she's never really had to do before is do something where the buck might very well end up with the prime minister. So that's a, the distinct awkwardness of this particular investigation. And of course, she's only doing it now because it was originally tasked to the cabinet secretary, Simon Case. But then 10 days later, he had to recuse himself when it was revealed that he might have been at a party in the cabinet office. And as you say, Jill, it's a very unusual situation to have a civil servant ultimately in charge of a report that could uh, really severely impact the prime minister's position. And therefore, there does seem to be some confusion over how um, bad this report could really be for Boris Johnson. Um, because uh, ministers have ultimately all said, oh, we'll wait to this report. Boris Johnson has also said, wait to this report before you get there. I think some think it could say something along the lines of, you know, Boris Johnson broke the law, he must go. But that's not quite what we're talking about, is it? What is it more realistically going to say in terms of the various scenarios? So the thing she was asked to investigate was whether there were parties, because remember, this investigation was set up when that uh, video that the Prime Minister told the Commons he was shocked by, the uh, Allegra Stratton video came out and the Prime Minister had still been telling Parliament that there were no parties, that guidance was followed at all times. So uh, Sue Gray is really trying to establish the facts about were there parties. Um, the interesting thing is how much further does she go than that? Does she tell us uh, she'd probably say some things about the culture in number 10 and the way they treated that? 
Does she go into why did they think they were compatible with the prevailing guidance and rules at the time? We know the guidance and rules are a bit different sometimes. So why do they think this was okay? Does she tell us anything about who were the movers and shakers behind having these parties? Uh, Does she tell us anything about what the Prime Minister knew or didn't know? I don't know how narrowly or widely she'll interpret her remit. Uh, I think she's in a really, really difficult position. What Sue Gray won't do, though, is say the Prime Minister must go. That really she will pass the ball over to two two different sort of sets of people. One for the sort of fallout for any civil servants implicated and criticised in her report, if she does that, then any disciplinary action doesn't fall to Sue Gray, it falls to Simon Case as the head of the civil service. Any fallout for the prime minister, uh, she can't do that. She's not going to say Boris Johnson's got to go. Basically, she'll hand the report to the prime minister. The prime minister could decide to refer himself to Lord Guite or to the Parliamentary Standards Commissioner, possibly, uh, who can make judgments on whether he breached the ministerial code. Um, But really, 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 the important action then turns to the Prime Minister's backbench colleagues uh, and his ministers and his cabinet. Do they think that based on whatever facts Sue Gray chooses to expose and what evidence she uncovers, that the Prime Minister uh, can't go on? And that's really for them to determine. So... Yeah, the problem for Sue Gray is that she's really on a bit of a hiding to nothing. I think the civil service should never have accepted that it would investigate this because at the moment she's a convenient delaying tactic. But the trouble is that her report risks satisfying absolutely nobody. Uh, There will be people who say the civil service is trying to get at the prime minister. We have had quite a tricky period for relations between ministers and the civil service. And if you know it increases the pressure on the prime minister, people will say, well, we always knew the civil service didn't like this government very much. Uh, if, however, it you know gives meat to those who want to exonerate the prime minister, then she'll be accused of doing a whitewash for her political masters. So I think it's in a really, really difficult position. It just shows why actually you should never ask a civil servant to investigate the prime minister. And as, and as you touched on, I mean, we've already seen Jacob Rees-Mogg, the leader of the House, um, talk about how if there, you know, is HR in a report, ultimately it's civil servants who should lose their jobs um, rather than politicians. That would not be the, the right way about going about things. Um, before, I suppose, we get on to potentially civil servants who could be vulnerable, I just wondered, one of the things that Sue Gray's report could do is bring more evidence to light, put it in the public uh, realm. And... What access does she get? Will she be able to look at things like CCTV? Um, we know, when it comes to, for example, that email which was leaked um, from Martin Reynolds inviting staff to a drinks party, that would be something she has hold of. But ha- what kind of teeth does she have when it comes to getting information? So the interesting thing is that the team is basically her old team, uh, including the guy, a guy called Darren Tierney, who's doing her old job as Director General of Propriety and Ethics. So what just changed was who was at the top of the investigation. Um, but these aren't like super sleuths. I mean, yes, uh, they will be asking people, uh, yeah, interviewing people, uh, asking them what went on, uh, interviewing a lot of people in number 10, I imagine. Uh, they may have asked for access anyone has to memos, whether people disclose them or whether we find that the people outside government actually have better access than Sue Gray. I mean, it would be really interesting to know whether she knew about the 20th of May party in its full glory before it, you know, Dominic Cummings sort of put it into the public domain and that memo was leaked to Paul Brand at ITV. We don't know that. Um, I think when the real risk for Sue Gray is that People think that she's been a bit over hasty and not got the full information out. But, you know, this isn't a sort of police investigation. Uh, it's a disciplinary, if you like, investigation to see whether uh, about behaviour internally. So it's more an HR style investigation. So she'll depend it on you know people wanting to cooperate with their bosses. But the clear message from Simon Case's civil servants should be that you have to engage with Sue Gray and let her have all the information that you have. Downing Street, as you say, does have sort of security videos. We saw that in the famous Plebgate investigation into Andrew Mitchell, that those security cameras there. But 
is it that obvious? I mean, the people working in number 10, uh, she might be able to say when, for example, at the famous 18th December party, the first party, were there lots of outsiders that booked into number 10? When you go into number 10, as you know, Katie, you have to sort of sign in, you know, show your pass, be on a list. Uh, she might want to look at that. But if it's just staff in number 10, uh, do we know that, you know, are there photographs of people going in, you know, handing big crates of booze or whatever? Or did they just have a sort of, you know, few cans in their backpack? A uh, bit difficult to tell. And I know when I went to number 10, I was always a bit embarrassed about being caught on camera going into number 10 with that week's stash of Diet Cokes to get me through the week. So, yeah, I mean, people do work there as well <laughs> as party there. So it's quite difficult in that sense to do that. So um, does she interview Dorman? I don't know. I mean, you know, it's up for her to decide how to do it and to balance, I think, almost the need for speed uh, against the need for this to be clearly a sort of, you know, thorough job. And Sue Gray will also have an eye on her own personal reputation. I mean, she'll want to have been seen to have done a good, thorough, professional and fair job because ultimately a lot of job people's, you know, future careers could be blighted by what she says. Uh, so she has to be quite careful that she is genuinely fair to those. Yeah. And just and just finally, um, we talked about how ultimately ousting a prime minister is always going to be a political decision. But there are some uh, other figures, Martin Reynolds, um, the senior um, uh, advisor to Boris Johnson, a civil service, who um, ultimately sent that email. Um, uh, so do you think we could start to see um, civil servants referred for um, you know, disciplinary or that could be the perhaps the scalps of this report? Well, that will ultimately be a decision for Simon Case, assuming, of course, that Simon Case himself doesn't come in for criticism in the report, which is also possible. Uh, I think, you know, it'll be very interesting to see how this plays. If there's absolutely sort of unequivocal evidence that civil servants in number 10 uh, basically indulge in sort of serial rule breaking, then I think it'd be very difficult for them to stay there. And indeed, those are the very people who should have been advising the Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister had come down and said, oh, it's a nice day, you know, we should thank staff at a work event outside. And the civil servants hadn't sort of advised, well, Prime Minister, we think that, you know, would look very incompatible with the guidance that Oliver Downing is just about to tell the nation about at the Downing Street press conference. I mean, you know, you would possibly just criticise civil servants, even if their involvement was only that. If they were the movers and shakers behind this, then that's a that's a different thing. And I think when the test for the civil service is how does it handle that? If something looks to the public like sort of really egregious behaviour, but the civil service's response is to try and brush it under a carpet and just perhaps slightly sooner than might otherwise have happened, move that person into the job they would have got anyway then I think the civil service will probably be criticised for not taking this seriously enough. So I think there's uh, there's going to be quite a tricky question. The other big question, I think, for number 10, and I don't know whether Sue Gray will see that says within her remit at all or not, is on what basis did the Prime Minister give all those assurances that the guidelines were followed at all times? Because that really is one of the big issues for the Prime Minister, notwithstanding whether he went to that particular party or not. There's also a big issue about whether he you know, misled Parliament, you can say, certainly looked a bit economical with what he admitted to knowing about, uh, given what has happened in number 10. And I I don't know whether Sue Gray is going to go into how number 10 handled the questioning about this, because clearly they weren't at all forthcoming until that initial video leak forced their hand. Thank you, Jill.